Hi everyone, Brian here wishing you a wonderful Monday and a great week ahead. For those of you who have been listening to these videos, you know that we've been talking about the recovery of the human soul that exists within each and every one of us. The soul is that place deep within us that gives birth to awarenesses of everything from beauty and awe uh, to the meaning and significance of life, and uh, perhaps more rarely, but nevertheless, occasionally for all of us, a sense that we have stepped out of the normal uh, everyday life and tapped into the rhythm of the divine that is swirling through the universe around us. Yoda would have called this the Force. Uh, but for Yoda, that force is simply a culmination of energy in the universe created by all uh, the living things within the uh, galaxy or the cosmos. Uh, Christians understand it just slightly differently, that rather than uh, living beings giving birth to the force, the force or uh, divine grace gives birth uh, to uh, that self-awareness, uh, to the created order uh, in which we live and, and sense it from time to time. So that's what we've been about, uh, rediscovering our conscious awareness of this deep soul within and recognizing that the whole of Scripture, the Hebrew Scriptures, but most particularly for Christians, of course, the New Testament Scriptures, are paying homage to this living reality that exists within each of us. Though the Bible is filled with stories of people who are particularly consciously aware of it and who have uh, sagas in their life story uh, that attest to their living according to this. And uh, that's true. We started with Abraham uh, in the book of Genesis. Uh, as our launch to look at the Hebrew scriptures and many figures in, in the Hebrew scriptures that tell this story. And then we launched with Joseph, uh, the father of Jesus, in the uh, first book. He's the first story in the first book of the New Testament. Again, we saw that same rhythm. Most recently, we've been looking at a relationship that occurred in the uh, gospel according to John between a Pharisee named Nicodemus and Jesus. Nicodemus came to him at night. And uh, there's this, been this dialogue, which was a delightful way for us to see Jesus and Nicodemus really talking about this soulful nature that exists within us and how Jesus wanted to invigorate it and give it new life. Uh, but, of course, for us, that means uh, becoming consciously aware of it. And uh, in that dialogue, Nicodemus is looking for how on earth uh, that can truly come into our life's experience. Uh, it ends with a fairly long conversation, or not conversation, sort of uh, a long uh, sort of mini speech by Jesus to Nicodemus that opens up uh, how to be aware of this. And that little speech that ends this relationship between Nicodemus and Jesus in the Gospel of John concludes really with a, a sense of what is uh, God's light truly like. So I thought uh, in this session we'd look back to that opening uh, uh, verses, the opening verses from the same Gospel, Gospel of John, which uh, are really uh, a resonance uh, with this uh, conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. Uh, when Jesus speaks to Nicodemus about the special light that uh, people of truth and authenticity and wholeness will live by, it's uh, for John, who wrote the gospel, it's the same light that he introduces his whole gospel by. It's a fairly famous passage. I'm going to read it first from our New Revised Standard Version, the one, the official version that's used uh, by the Episcopal Church and that we use in all our readings here on, on Sunday. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. 
What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. And just to hear it again um, from uh, uh, Eugene Peterson's uh, translation, The Message. Again, the reason we use the message is uh, too often, I think, uh, we hear scripture as we hear it on Sunday, and it just rolls past us with the traditional um, language sort of hitting those traditional places in our brain to give us, oh yes, I know this, I recognize this passage, it's a comfort for me to hear it again, like um, hearing a favorite piece of music on the radio. Oh yes, there's my favorite piece of music. Uh, for many people, of course, this is a favorite uh, piece of scripture. Uh, uh, Peterson's translation is not all that much different um, uh, in this little section, uh, but it does have those few moments of uh, refreshment. The Word was first. The Word present to God. God present to the Word. The Word was God in readiness for God from day one. Everything was created through him. Nothing, not one thing, came into being without him. What came into existence was life, and the life was light to live by. This life light blazed out of the darkness. The darkness couldn't put it out. Uh, this is the uh, core, really, teaching uh, that John has. There's a reason he starts his gospel with this understanding, and there's a reason it gets resonated in stories like the one we just uh, have been looking at uh, in chapter 3, the relationship between uh, Jesus and um, uh, Nicodemus the Pharisee. Uh, so, for John, He's talking about a, a, a life force that is part of the initial and inaugural uh, beginnings of the universe itself. Karl Rahner, no, that's not true. Richard Rohr, sorry, Richard Rohr points out uh, that uh, the incarnation that we celebrate in the church as we get ready for Christmas and remember the Annunciation to, to Mary uh, in the uh, Gospel according to Luke and the birth narratives that we find in both Luke and the Gospel according to Matthew, uh, they're very clear that uh, these two uh, Gospel writers really want to convey that the incarnation, that who Christ really was, uh, is, is a reality from his conception and a reality from his birth. That both shepherds in the field uh, want to respond to him uh, in that uh, moment of incarnation, as do astrologers from the East. Uh, but uh, Richard Rohr points out that this incarnation uh, is, at least for human beings on this planet, the actual second incarnation of the living Word of God. The first incarnation of the Word of God occurs at Big Bang, at the moment, the millisecond, uh, of Big Bang, uh, which was an explosion of energy and matter uh, creating as it exploded time and space, so that time, space, energy, and matter all burst out uh, of uh, whatever uh, that millisecond before Big Bang, whatever that reality was, Big Bang bursts out of that. Uh, the uh, world of uh, physics, astrophysics, natural sciences, and uh, living biology uh, will all be uh, uh, limited to those four things, time, space, energy, and matter. Uh, the religious person, the faithful person, adds a fifth one, which is exactly what uh, the author of John's Gospel is telling us, uh, both in the opening verses of the gospel itself and at the core of the dialogue between Jesus and Nicodemus. And that is that at this bursting moment when the physical universe takes on its uh, core elemental reality, 
uh, that the living word of God is there from that moment on. And that the living word of God is uh, creating what uh, Eugene Peterson calls the life light, uh, or simply uh, the light of God, uh, as our NRSV would put it. Uh, that this living light, the, the light that is the life, the, the, the livingness, the liveliness, the zest, uh, and we can go on to say all of the other things that we, we uh, comprehend as people of faith, the beauty, the joy, the hope, um, and the fullness of, uh, of a universe that we now know uh, as the result of quantum mechanics, we now know that from that moment of Big Bang, that at the extreme subatomic level of Big Bang, which is what it was at that moment, subatomic explosion, uh, the universe is full of potential. In other words, the universe, as we might say in sort of traditional Christian language, the universe itself has free will. It, it's full of potential at every moment of its existence, uh, including this moment that we're living in. Uh, and yet, at the same time, there is this living word of God that is joyously interacting with this exploding, expanding universe that eventually becomes, uh, on our planet, um, a planet abundant uh, with life as, as we uh, experience it here. Uh, all of this has the living word of God integrating within it. And what Jesus shows us in his life is, of course, all of the things that Christians normally uh, look to. Uh, what is the basic moral way to live life? If you believe in God, how, does, how do human beings react uh, and interact with uh, the divine? How does the divine want us to react and interact with our fellow human beings? Uh, and all of that sort of thing is there, and, and Jesus' life is about that. At the same time, Jesus is teaching us, and, and the Gospel according to John uh, wants us to get this in particular, that Jesus is also showing us the eternal, the everlasting, the cosmic, the galactic, uh, the universal reality of the living Word of God profoundly and deeply integrated uh, into the very fabric of the way the universe is. It is one of the essential truths of how the universe uh, works itself out, uh, certainly in its physical expansion out of Big Bang and into an extraordinary universe full of galaxies and stars and planets and black holes and all of that sort of thing, and, and exemplified for us on this extraordinary living planet, uh, third from uh, our own sun, um, that that the living word of God is, is showing us a rhythm, a divine truth that's, that's uh, there through all of, of time and space. And um, so when we are looking for the divine within the soul, we have this sort of guidepost to understand the God that we're looking for. Unfortunately, in the West in particular, we have overdefined that God, uh, patriarchalized that God, uh, narrowly defined that God, dogmatically defined that God, um, in such a way that when we go to look inside for it, uh, the God that's emerging uh, from deep within uh, is uh, often unrecognizable uh, by uh, religiously alive people because they're looking for, uh, you know, the God who wants to separate out good people from bad people. Uh, who's always looking for a reason to get you into heaven or toss you into hell. Um, uh, these uh, metaphorical understandings of scripture have been overused and uh, probably it would be true to say abused by the church so that we've lost the image of uh, the real God who is bubbling up within us. Uh, and at its core is um, an odd paradox that we've failed uh, to embrace. The paradox is this, that on the one hand, God is the almighty, omnipotent, ever-seeing, uh, un unbelievably potent reality outside of time and space that can inaugurate and initiate 
uh, the entire created order and has an alpha and an omega for it, that there is an inaugural um, beginning place, which we call we do call Big Bang, but that God has a purpose for Big Bang that will carry it through uh, to whenever time space um, culminates in whatever energy and matter will end in uh, at the end of time, which uh, we think of as the omega uh, intention of God. Uh, that we've got all that part down and, and we see ourselves as sort of subjected to this almighty God who has a purpose and are we aligned with that purpose or are we not aligned to that purpose? All of that is absolutely true. However, it becomes contorted and weird and out of whack when we don't hold it next to uh, the uh, other side of the paradox, which is that Jesus in his life is showing us not only how human beings should respond to God, but how God inaugurates the relationship with us. And therefore, so for example, therefore, for example, when we look at um, Jesus' life of sacrifice, including the sacrifice of his life on the cross, he is not just showing us that human beings should make a sacrifice of their own life, sacrificing themselves for the sake of others, sacrificing their lives and egos and turning them over to God. Um, again, uh, if you only have that, you end up with a contorted religion. Uh, but to show um, us that that is how God is inaugurating his life with us. In other words, the primary way in which we know God, uh, or uh, at least this other side of the paradox, is that God is evident not through power and omnipotence and judgment, but through divine self-sacrifice for the sake of the creation, the utter giving of God, the, the, um, the, the giving of the word of God is not simply a God sitting in some golden chair and, and speaking a word. The, the word is the living uh, aspect. I mean, we think of it as son to father, but it's, it's, it's an actual part of God. And God gave that uh, living word to the entire created order, ripped the divine reality apart in order to give this living word to the universe at Big Bang, gave it again uh, in the incarnation of Jesus Christ and gives it all the time. So that when we are looking for God, and this was the problem Nicodemus had, Nicodemus was looking for the God of the covenant, um, which uh, could be clear and understood in terms of rules and expectations and uh, uh, that all of the, the covenantal laws that uh, the Hebrew people lived by, all of which uh, Jesus said, I'm not here to corrupt that. I'm here to introduce to you the other half of the paradox, which you must hold together, just like Moses uh, on the mountain held together a bush that was on fire, but a bush that was not being consumed by that fire. Uh, it's when you can live with that paradox that God is all-powerful and omnipotent and all of that sort of thing. And at exactly the same moment, God is self-sacrificial, gi utterly giving of the divine self for the sake of each and every one of us on this creation. That's a little bit mind-blowing. Uh, all paradoxes are. But especially this one, because we in the West have overemphasized um, this idea of a powerful God that's always judging and kind of ignored uh, a God that is merciful and self-sacrificing for our sake. Uh, we've turned that over in some instances to a pious, um, gentle Jesus, in some instances to a uh, loving, uh, blessed Virgin Mary, uh, to some of the saints. We've, we've given that all over uh, to, some, to them and ignored it in God the Creator. But it's right there. So that as we uh, investigate uh, soulfulness, the, the point of, of Jesus, and therefore the point of the whole New Testament, is to uh, make sure that we have uh, this paradoxical view of, of the divine. And for us in the West and in the 21st century, it's really important to recover, rediscover, uh, re-embrace this half of that paradox 
again, not overemphasize it from this one because it's always about the paradox, uh, but it has to be that paradox that includes an awareness of the gentle, always giving, self-sacrificing nature of the divine. Uh, it's that that Jesus has to get across uh, to Nicodemus. It's that which John wishes to get across to us in his gospel. Uh, and it's that which we must enter into if when we go inward to look for this soulfulness within, we are looking for the God who is already there looking for us. Uh, so uh, let's try to get that little bit of discipline into our heads, and then we'll start to look at other aspects of New Testament teaching just to see if it's not resonated there. So thanks for listening once again, and I'll be with you next Monday. Blessings till then.